Aja Salama to pray for us. Salu ala nabiyil kareem. Salala ala nabiyil kareem. Salala ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad. Kama salayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim. Fi al-hala minna inda kamil majid. آمن الرسول بما أنزل إليه والمؤمنين كل آمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله وقالوا سمعنا وعطانا غفرانك ربنا إليك المسير لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها لها ما كسبت وعليها ما اكتسبت ربنا ولا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا وعطانا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إسرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به وأفؤنا وافتر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على الكون القادم. أمين. يا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم. Believes in what has been sent down to him from his Lord and so do the believers. Each one believes in Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers. They say we make no distinction between one. Please, Aja Salamatu, please unmute yourself. I had to mute everybody because somebody was talking at the background. The messenger of Allah believes in what has been sent down to him from his Lord, and so do the believers. Each one believes in Allah, his messengers, his angels, his books, and they say we make no distinction between one and another of his messengers. And they say, we hear, we obey, we seek your forgiveness, our Lord. To you is our return. Allah burdens not a person beyond his cup. He gets reward for what good which he has earned, and is punished for his evil that which he earned. Our Lord, punish us not if we forget or fall in error. Our Lord, lay not on us burden like that which you have laid on those before us. Our Lord, put not on us a burden greater than we have strength to bear. Pardon us, grant us forgiveness, and have mercy on us. You are our Patron, supporter, protector, and give us victory over the disbelieving. I have completed the prayer. Yeah, thank you. Sister Peace, please, can you say pray for, your, pray for us now? Okay, I don't think she's there. Sister, please unmute yourself and pray. Okay. Unmute yourself and pray. Yeah. All right. Thank you, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, for making it possible for us to be among the living of this day. Thank you for your graces. Thank you for your mercies. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for this golden opportunity you have granted us this evening. We ask you, good and gracious Father, that you come and be with us in our deliberation. O oh God, in the presentation of today, O oh God, may it yield a fruitful harvest. Lord, grant us peace. Grant us unity. Grant all that is lacking in our country, Nigeria especially, and grant our good heart desires. We pray to the Lord. Amen. Yeah, thank you very much, my dear brothers and sisters, especially Sister Peace and Salamat who has prayed for us. Today is, the attendance today is very good. We are beginning this September with a theme on education. Education, you know, is the foundation the roots of the future of any nation. And we committed the Education Committee of NIREC to handle this session. And as you can see from this committee, they were able to locate two wonderful experts on this topic on education policy. The whole of this September will be dedicated to education. So as we go, we'll be unfolding them. So I want to thank our brother, the chairman of the Education Committee, Professor Mafuz Adedimeji, 
for doing a very wonderful work. Professor Mahfouz will be wonderful, especially with NIREC activity. So, Professor Mahfouz, how are you? So thank, thank you, my executive secretary. Thank, thank you for you the honest recommendation. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. No, no, honestly, you are just wonderful. I'll be worried that you have not been flowing with us. So, so now, as usual, we have to do a little bit of recap, after which we will introduce our presenters. So, so we are going to first of all do a recap to see what we have done so far. And I think that is very, very important for us because there are some people who may be joining us even today. They have not been joining us so that they know what we have been doing. We started this webinar with the topic Anthropological Foundation of Character. Then we went as held education from womb to tomb. That's then that's principles that's and that's dynamics that's of dialogue, challenges of religious pluralism, basis for dialogue in Africa, national unity and religious cooperation. The role of NIREC in strengthening national unity, human destiny and time, the role of Islam in dialogue and peace building, the church and the interreligious dialogue, breaking barriers, promoting inclusion and integration for refugees. The effort of Muslim women, dialogue and peace building the contribution of Africa Council of Religious Leaders, Religious for Peace to Dialogue and Global Peace. Kaisid it a religious dialogue and peace beauty in the world. Personality crisis and power crisis. Personality and power crisis. The efforts of Christian women in dialogue and peace building the role of Ufuk dialogue in promoting peace in Nigeria, religious freedom in Nigeria, dialogue and information management, forms of dialogue, quest for the ideology of the terrorists, the role of the institution for peace and conflict resolution, IPCR, in peace building in Nigeria, the role of the Women Interfaith Council Week in dialogue and peace building in Nigeria, public policy on education in Nigeria, assessment of opportunities and challenges is what we are going to have today. In today's discussion, we are going to look at the policy, how it affects our children, given that if there's no proper foundation for education, it can affect the future of the nation. Like a lot of people have attributed or alluded to the fact that the bad history and the insurgency we have in Nigeria today is a result of lack of education, out of school children, and lack of home training. So before we, so right now, you permit me to present the speakers, those who are going to speak to us today on this very important topic. So I would like to graciously introduce our erudite scholar, a professor of no mean character, our our sister, Professor Adiza Ahmed Tuko. PhD. I explained this in my church today because actually you can be a professor without having a doctorate. Because professorship is to accord you 
that excellence is a kind of award to acknowledge the fact that you are originator, you are actor, you have made yourself known. So you can see why our sister had to put PhD at the end. So she's not just a professor, like called, uh, you know, he's a real academic professor. So Professor Adiza Ahmed Tuku is a distinguished professor of educational psychology in the Department of Educational Psychology and Counseling at Amadou Bele University, Zaria. She earned both her master's and PhD de degrees in educational psychology from the same prestigious institution. So before joining the university, Professor Hadiza worked with the Kaduna State Ministry of Education, where she served as a vice principal for five years and a principal for seven years. Additionally, she has held significant roles in the Federation of Muslim Women Association in Nigeria, Form 1, including serving as a Kaduna State Admirer for four years. Currently, she is the secretary of the Form 1 National Education Committee. And the assistant national public relations officer. So that is our sister. That is our sister. So now let me now present our brother who is also going to speak from the Christian perspective. So mm -hmm. So here, so here we have our brother Dean Reverend Uzumba Emmanuel Nicodemus, who is going to be the second presenter. He hails from Demsa, local government area of Adamawa State. He pursued his theological education at the Theological College of Northern Nigeria, where he earned both a bachelor's and a master's degree in theology. Additionally, he holds a bachelor of art degree from the University of Jess. His academic journey took him further to Rutberg International School at Hebrew University in Jerusalem and Jerusalem Center for Bible Translation, Israel. Reverend Nicodemus is an ordained priest with the Lutheran Church of Christ in Nigeria. His clerical career includes serving as a secretary to the bishops of the Abuja Diocese and as a chaplain of the Theological College of Nota Nigeria in Bukuru. Currently, he is a district pastor of LCCC Garke District, Dean of LCCC Abuja Division, and the Vice Bishop of LCCN Abuja Diocese. At the Ecumenical and Interfaith City, Reverend Nikodemu serves as the National Director for Education, Youth and Women Development, for the Christian Association of Nigeria, can. He's also actively and currently the secretary of the Educational Committee at the Nigeria Interreligious Council, NIREC, and is an active member of public issues and finance committees. Reverend Nicodemus is married to Mrs. Blessing Nicodemus, and together they are blessed with three children. Barakel, Bexile, and I said. So that is our brother, Dean Utuma. So I would like uh, Mafuz to note that after the two presentations, Mafuz was a summary of what, as the summary of what your department have been able to achieve today, after which, not admit, you know, we will invite you to do that but after the contribution and questions from different groups. 
So, my dear brothers and sisters, thank you very much for listening. I now invite our sister, Professor Tuku, to take the floor. Thank you. Prof, you can unmute yourself and start now. Prof, are you there? Please unmute yourself. Hello, should I help you share your screen? Prof, are you there? Please. Should I share your screen for you? Some. I said I can easily share your screen from here. No, come in please. Mm. Um, hey. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Can you see the screen now? Yes. It's visible. Yes, we can see. Thank you. I'm sorry for the, for the little delay, please. Yeah, welcome. Uh, I'm honored to be here on this platform to present uh, this paper. Actually, this is the first time I am here. So I hope uh, you will be here with me. Now I've been asked to present uh, a paper on public policy on education in Nigeria. Now I, I prepared the paper to spend about one hour or one and a half hours on it. You know, being an academician, I thought it was going to be academic uh, sort of presentation, but I understand that it's go only going to be 30 minutes. As such, I have to just speak to the paper. Now I have the abstract, which I will not read, but you can see it there. Now I'm starting with the introduction. Uh, education is universally recognized as a foundation of individual and, so, uh, and societal development deeply embedded in the fabric of modern civilization. The significance of education is highlighted in numerous global declaration, declarations. Most notably is uh, in the Article 26 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which asserts that education is an indisputable human right. Education is not only a mechanism for personal empowerment, but also a driving force behind national progress, contributing to the economic, social, and political development of nations. The relationship between education and development has been well documented with education recognized as a fundamental driver of economic growth, poverty reduction, and social equity. For example, Studies have consistently shown that increased education attainment correlates with higher economic productivity, improved health outcomes, and greater civic participation. This explains why the Nigerian government recognizing education's profound impact on national development has historically placed significant emphasis on 
formulating and implementing educational policies aimed at broadening access, improving quality, and promoting equity. The federal government of Nigeria and its national policy of, on education articulates the vision of education as an instrument for excellence for achieving national goals. This vision stresses the role of education in fostering united, strong, and self-reliant nation capable of competing in a globalized world. Despite these ambitions, the Nigerian education system is afflicted by numerous challenges that hinder its ability to achieve its vision. And some of these uh, challenges include inadequate funding, poor infrastructure, shortage of qualified teachers, and systematic inefficiencies in, public, in policy implementation. As a result, millions of Nigerian children remain out of school, and those who are enrolled often achieve substandard education in preparing them for future opportunities in a competitive global economy. The scale of out of children uh, school is alarming. For example, UNICEF 2022 uh, declared that Nigeria accounts for 15% of the total global population of out of school children with at least 10.5 million Nigerian children not attending school. This represents a third of the Nigerian children, which implies that for every three children, one is out of school. And learning environments are far from conducive. This situation maintains a cycle of poverty and underdevelopment as uneducated or poorly educated individuals are less likely to secure meaningful employment or contribute effectively to social societal growth. The implication affects the broader socioeconomic foundation of the nation as education is shown to be a significant determinant of health outcomes. You will see that, and you will agree with me that, people who are better educated are, are individuals who or who are more likely to engage in healthy behaviors, they access healthcare services, and most often than not, they lead a longer and healthier lives. You can see that in uh, among our uh, elders here who are educated compared to their counterparts who are not educated. Education is linked to social stability also because it promotes tolerance understanding and ensures peaceful resolution of conflicts. This organization gives a testimony to that fact. Given the critical importance of education to Nigerians' future, it is imperative to critically assess the current public policy on education, identifying both opportunities for the improvement and the significant challenges that must be addressed. Now, Number two, the national policy. Public policy formulation in uh, public policy formulation in Nigerian education. Now let's start with the governance. Nigeria is characterized by a complex interplay, interplay of roles and responsibilities distributed up, across three tiers of government, which include the federal, the state, and the local uh, lo local governments. This is tailored to the specific needs of different regions while maintaining a cohesive national strategy. Now let's look at the responsibilities of each tier of government. The federal government through the federal minister of education holds the primary responsibility for, form, uh, for policy formulation, coordination and monitoring. The management of tertiary institutions like universities and polytechnics and uh, federal colleges of education are directly funded and administered at the federal level. 
Similarly, the federal government oversees limited number of secondary schools, which are called the unity schools or federal government colleges. It is also responsible for setting national education standards and policies that guide the overall education system. Uh, the ministry works closely with various agencies and parastatus, such as uh, UBEC, NUC, among others. Now, state, this is what the state governments do. They play a critical role in the management and administration of secondary school education, a substantial portion of tertiary education within their uh, respective juris, uh, jurisdictions. State ministries of education are also responsible for implementing federal education policies at state level with some flexibility to adapt these policies to local conditions and needs. State governments are also empowered to establish uh, higher institutions such as state universities, polytechnics, and uh, state colleges of education. They are often funded by the state, and then sometimes federal government also uh, aids them. They also collaborate with the federal government in implementation of national education initiatives like the UBEC. Then what does the local government do? Uh, what is the responsibility of the local government? The local governments, the local governments are primarily responsible for the management of primary education, including the administration jurisdictions. They are to ensure that primary schools are adequately staffed, equipped, and maintained. Another key role is of the local government is in mobilizing the community, working with parents, community leaders, and civil society organizations to promote school attendance and support educational initiatives, among other responsibilities. Then another, another arm is that of uh, is the National Council on Education called NCE. This serves as all state commissioners of education and it plays a central role in the formulation and approval of national education policies. It is responsible for approving the national curriculum for primary and secondary education. It sets policies across all education levels and overseeing the implementation of major national education initiatives, among others. Uh, the, nas the, national, uh, the next one is the JSCE, uh, that is the Joint Consultative Committee on Education. This consists of professional officers from faculties of universities, uh, faculties of education from the national universities, uh, federal ministry of education, state ministries of education, and other relevant bodies. It, uh, its responsibility here is that it serves as advice as a, an advisory body, providing technical input and recommendations on various aspects of education policy and implementation, among other things it does. The National Policy on Education serves as the country's educational policy document, reiterating the all-encompassing philosophy and goals of education in Nigeria. It specifies the objectives, the structure, and the strategies for educational provision, as well as guidelines and standards for delivery, management, and quality assurance. The policy also clarifies the roles of the three tiers of government mentioned above. Over the time, the policy has undergone revisions to adapt to the evolving social landscape and educational demands with the latest update occurring in 2013, which is called the sixth edition of the National Policy on Education. Now, despite these updates, the foundational philosophy of the, uh, of the policy remains unchanged, emphasizing education as a tool for national development, social change, and individual empowerment. The policy uh, some of the national, uh, some of the, the let me uh, read, uh, 
maybe just uh, give an example of some of the philosophies of education. Uh, one of them is education is a tool for national development and social change. Another is the view of education as a compulsory right for every Nigerian, free from discrimination. Another philosophy embedded in the national policy is that the emphasis on education being, the emphasis on education is being on qualitative, comprehensive, functional, and relevant. So all these are stated in the national policy. Now, let, let us look at the key elements of uh, the education policy. Now, the formulation of education policies in Nigeria is quite complex and uh, multifaceted process that involves a careful consideration of various key elements, including context, input, process, and outcomes. When here, context refers to the broader environment within which education policies are developed and implemented. This includes the socioeconomic, cultural, political, and historical factors that influence policy decisions. The input here encompasses resources required to implement education policies effectively. These resources include human resources, material resources, and financial resources. The last one is the process. The process of education is influenced by various factors, such as the quality of the teacher training, the variability of teaching materials, and so on and so forth. Despite all this, we it has some challenges. Now, let, let, uh, some of the challenges some of the challenges include inadequate funding, inconsistent policies, corruption, and so on and so forth. Now we have seen the public formula formulation. We have seen the federal and state government, how they work. Uh, now let us look at some of the initiatives. Now one of the initiatives is the UBEC, the Universal Basic Education. It is a supporting initiative of Nigeria's education system program, which was introduced to provide free and compulsory education to all Nigerian children. This program is significant component of the broader effort to ensure that every child has access to quality education, particularly in the foundational levels of schooling. Now, what are the objectives of the UBEC? One is universal access to education for all Nigerian children. One, another is to reduce disparity in education access and quality across different regions and socioeconomic groups. Another one is improvement of educational quality, then lifelong learning. Now, some of the challenges of the UB, let us look at some of the challenges of the UBEC. Now, it says that, okay, the implementation, sorry, implementation. It is said, it is said that it is free and compulsory. Uh, the teacher-pupil ratio should be one to 35. It also emphasizes on continuous assessment rather than one single exam. And um, this approach, uh, it provides a more holistic evaluation of students' performance. You see, that is why in, in children's report card, now you see academic and uh, affective domains. 
uh, then we have the infrastructure development where classes and uh, libraries and laboratories are expected to be built. Then we have community engagement. Uh, UBEC is, uh, encourages the involvement of parents, communities, and civil society organizations in the management and oversight of schools. This is intended to foster a sense of ownership and accountability, as well as ensure that schools are responsive to the needs of the community they serve. Now, what are the challenges? These are, these are the intentions for you, Beck. And uh, you will agree with me that uh, these are very noble intentions and will go a long way to ensure quality education for the Nigerian child. However, it also comes with its own challenges, which includes inadequate funding, poor infrastructure, shortage of qualified teachers, and persistent regional dis di disparities in educational access and quality. You will agree with me that the quality of education for children in the rural area is not the same the quality of education for children in the urban areas, particularly in public schools. Uh, the impact of UBE program is mixed. On the one hand, you will agree with me that the enrollment is, has been increased. More children go to school. But the question is, how qualitative is this education? Now let us look at uh, another, another initiative that is the girl-child education. The girl-child education is a critical focus of Nigerians' educational policy. It reflects the recognition of the important role that education plays in empowering girls and promoting gender equality. Now, the objective of the girl-child education initiatives also includes increasing enrollment and retention, improving educational outcomes for girls, promoting gender equality. Now, the strategies used to ensure this by the government is, one, scholarship programs to encourage girls to go to school. Another one is conditional cash transfer. That was, uh, then we also had uh, this, uh, is it feeding program? Then we have community awareness campaign. And then we have safe school initiative, especially for, for, for girls who live in conflict uh, uh, bedeviled areas. Now the impacts and challenges. Efforts to promote girl-child education in Nigeria have yielded significant progress, quite all right, with increased enrollment rates and improved educational outcomes for girls in many regions. However, the challenges remain, particularly in areas where cultural norms and security concerns continue to pose barriers to education. And this is more in the Northeast and the Northwest regions of the country, where mostly we see child marriage and other cultural practices that prevent the enrollment of girls and uh, uh, the enrollment of girls in schools. And then the quality of education received by girls in many public schools is often compromised by factors such as overcrowded classrooms. You go to public schools, you find over 100, 200 in some schools, children in a class. In adequate teaching materials, there is hardly any and insufficient trained teachers. These challenges underscore the need for continued investment in girl-child education and for targeted interventions that address the specific barriers faced by girls. Another intervention is that of vocational and technical education. Quite all right, vocational and technical education is an integral component of the Nigerian education, uh, education system designed to equip students with practical skills and competencies that are directly relevant to the labor market. 
The objectives include skills development, reducing unemployment, supporting economic growth, growth rather. Then the strategies used are public-private partnership, curriculum development, teacher training, infrastructure and equipment. Now, the challenges still remain that challenges for achieving this uh, uh, vocational and technical education are that this program faces the, the challenge of inadequate funding like the others, the, the equipment being used are outdated. Sometimes, like uh, when I was a school principal, there is this uh, technical department of, uh, is it a technical, it's a long time, I've forgotten technical education. Uh, we had a technical uh, lab, we had the equipment. It had been there for years, but when I wanted to mount them, I had to do that through PTA because the government was not ready to do it. We found that the floor built was inadequate. The contractor given did not do a good, well, a good work. The PTA rebuilt the floor. On opening the boxes of the, of the equipment, we discovered that the, instru the, inst the instructions on the instruments were written in a language that is not English. So the subjects, uh, the teachers could not even understand and it became very difficult to use the main equipment. Then we also had very a high shortage of qualified teachers. So that also affected that, uh, affects that uh, sector. Then another issue we have in, in, our, in, in our communities is that when you say you are in technical school, it is perceived as if it is not presti prestigious. Even in regular schools where children are assigned science, technical, commercial, and art, you see that parents will come and insist that they want their children to go for sciences, even where the children are more interested in the technical aspect of education. Now, let us look at uh, the challenges in policy formulation and implementation. Now we have seen the policies, we have seen the some of the initiatives. Now let us look at some of the challenges with the education policy implementation. Now the first one we said is inadequate funding. I think that is very clear. Uh, UNESCO proposes that a nation should uh, allocate 15 to 20% of its national budget. But in Nigeria, up till today, we have not been able to get up to 10%. Sometimes it will go a little bit high. And then when another government comes, it will give low, just like lower, just like it happened uh, in this uh, 2024. The budget allocated for education is lower than that of 2023. And this affects mostly, mostly on the sub areas and rural areas. They suffer severe infrastru infrastructural deficit. Classrooms are overcrowded. Some school lack basic facilities, such as decks. You find students sitting on the floor. Decks and chairs are not there. You hardly find even the blackboards. Some of them have holes when people are going digital with whiteboards now. And in extreme cases, students are, faced, are forced to learn in makeshift structures or under the trees, especially in our rural environments. In addition to the infrastructural, uh, uh, structural, structural challenges, uh, the lack of funding also affects the availability of teaching and learning materials. We, it also affects the availability of qualified teachers, we have shortage, especially in the sciences, you find that often there are shortage of such teachers. Then the next one is inconsistent policies and political instability. 
policies change that it lacks continuity sometimes but when politicians come or, or or leaders come they do things according to their whims rather than following the policy they change things the way they they feel like then corruption is another issue there is so much corruption that it affects the management and allocation of funds intended for educational development. And this also affects the policies uh, and the initiatives. Things like embezzlement of funds by government officials, exploitation of students and parents by school administrators and teachers. These are things we see and hear on daily basis especially in public schools. And sometimes it is uh, the government itself that will divert the money meant for education sector for to carry out some other projects. Another corruption we see in the educational sector is that of exam malpractice. And this is very high. It is even higher, I think, in, in, in private schools. You see that for, for private schools to, I don't know what they, they, they hope to achieve, but you see them even in normal day-to-day -day exams, they teach, they, they, they write the answers for students so that students or pupils will go back home with A's and their parents will assume that the school is doing very well. And... When you check uh, deeply, you find that that is not uh, the actual performance of the child. And this is actually affecting students, especially for those of us who are in the university. They come in with very high, uh, very, very good work results, very high jam scores. And when they do the, when they do the post uh, UME, you find that the scores go lower and when they come into the university, you wonder whether it is them that actually got that uh, uh, those uh, scores that they claim to have. Recently, a girl came to show me a WAEC result and I asked her, I said, please be sincere with me. You know that I'm a teacher. Just tell me the truth because I know the girl, she's my neighbor here. I said, were you taught in the school or then she just put herself, her head down and said, yes, mama, the answers were written for us on the blackboard. And she came asking me to get admission for her in the university to read nursing. So imagine the kind of nurses we are going to have or doctors. Now, poor quality of education and out of school children is another challenge. Quality of education. You see all these things I have mentioned above also affect the quality of education one way or the other. Then the curriculum of our schools are, are also outdated. We, the, the, the educational system focuses more on rot and memorization rather than developing critical thinking, problem solving and skills, pro, uh, problem solving skills and creativity. Uh, a few years ago, my grandson ha ha happened to be in, in the I think UK and uh, the teacher the, in his report card, they wrote that he could memorize everything, but he lacked critical thinking. So that is a very serious uh, issue for us. Students here, tradition is that you just memorize and send back to the teacher and you get your A's. And anytime you give questions that are application type of questions, students are not happy about it. They just want to read, cram and give you back. Then another thing is also lack of teacher training. We, you hardly see teachers being trained professionally. Either the fund is not allocated or the fund is used for something else. Then another one is educational inequality and regional disparities. We have mentioned this earlier, especially here in the Northern region. And then even in the North, there is disparity between the rural rural areas and the urban areas. 
Now let us look at the prospects for improvement. The challenges facing Nigerian's education system are significant and multifaceted, but they also present opportunities for meaningful reform. To move forward, it is essential to take stock of the lessons learned from the policy implementation and to craft a clear strategic path for future improvements. Now, let us reflect on the lessons from the past policy formulation. Uh, the experience of implementing education policies in Nigeria has revealed several critical insights that, that must inform future efforts. While the intentions behind many policies were well-funded, founded, their impact has often been undermined by factors such as inconsistent application, lack of stakeholder involvement, and inadequate monitoring. These in insights provide valuable guidance for ref refining and strengthening future policies. Now, one of the most significant lessons is the importance of tailoring educational policies to the diverse socioeconomic and cultural coexist, uh, to the diverse socioeconomic and cultural context within Nigeria. We have to do away with this one size fits all. There should be diversification to suit uh, the needs of each region. Effective resources of allocation management, the use of inadequate funding has been a recurring theme in the challenges faced by Nigeria's education system. However, it is not just the amount of funding that matters, but how effectively these resources are allocated and managed. Mismanagement, corruption, and inefficiency have often diverted much needed funds away from their intended purposes. So in future, we need to be focused and transparent on how to utilize the available funds. The role of stakeholder engagement, stakeholders that matter should be engaged in the formulation of policies so that they can put in, they can make their input and also on the policies. Strategic recommendations for future improvement. That is building on these lessons, the following strategic recommendations aim to address the core challenges and capitalize on opportunities for improvement within Nigerian's education system. One of them is enhanced stakeholder participation and community in, uh, in, involvement. When communities are involved, you find that uh, the school enrollment increases, the quality of education is also improved. The communities police and ensure that uh, the correct thing is done. Now, it is also recommended that uh, local education committee be established. These committees composed of representatives from various stakeholder groups can serve as advisory bodies that provide input on policy decisions and help monitor their implementation at the local level, promote uh, PTA, that is Parent Teacher Association, where uh, there is need to strengthen so that we, it can enhance collaboration between schools and families, ensuring that parents are actively engaged in their children's education and that their voices are heard in school management decisions. Then there is also need to invest in teacher training and professional development. There is need to strengthen vocational and technical education, integrate vocational training into the curriculum, then partner with industries so that uh, students partner with industries. And uh, before they finish school, they are able to realize what their dreams are, what they actually want to become when you partner, when schools partner with industries. Then we improve educational infrastructure and resource allocation. Adequate infrastructure and resources are fundamental to providing a conducive learning environment. So we must prioritize investment in school infrastructure and also construct new schools. So as to uh, construct new schools and renovate the existing ones. 
Then we also, there is also a need for provision of learning materials. Another thing that needs to be done is increase the budgetary allocation to education to meet the standards of, of uh, UNESCO. Then there is also need to implement transparent funding mechanism so that whatever is allocated is spent openly and people can track and monitor what is happening, especially civil societies. Then we should foster policy continuity and long-term planning. Create educational master plan, maybe for 20 to 30 years. And when you do this, it is, it is also necessary to establish an independent education commission. commission. This independent commission can help maintain continuity in education policy implementation by overseeing the execution of the National Education Master Plan I mentioned above. These commissions should be composed of education experts and representatives from various sectors who will ensure that they are well equipped and guide long-term educational reform. Enhance monitoring and evaluation, M&E, and then data utilization. We should also develop a comprehensive data collection system, which is lacking. Then regularly evaluate policy impact. We need to evaluate them from time to time so that anything that is not working, we find a way of adjusting or improving. Then promote data-driven decision-making. Uh, uh, at the policy-making, uh, uh, at the, at the pol when the policies are being made, it shouldn't be just be made on whims. They should be informed by data driven. I mean, by, by that, uh, they should be informed by the driven data. Let us know, let there be data to support uh, whatever decision that is being taken or that is, uh, yeah, that is being taken. Now, in conclusion, the challenges facing Nigerian's education system are substantial, yet they are not insurmountable. The analysis presented in this paper underscores the critical importance of education as a driver of national development and social progress. However, realizing the full potential of education in Nigeria requires addressing the deep-rooted issues that have historically underlined policy implementation and educational outcomes. These issues include inadequate funding, among others. A comprehensive reform strategy is essential for overcoming these challenges. The strategies must be rooted in the lessons learned from the past experiences and must prioritize the creation of policies that are contextually relevant, inclusive, and, adapt and adaptable to the diverse needs of the Nigerians, regions, and populations. A long-term vision for education, supported by stable and consistent policies, is crucial for, for achieving sustain, sustained program, progress. So, uh, uh, furthermore, significant investments in teacher training, vocational and technical education, and educational infrastructure are necessary to provide all students with quality education they deserve. Stakeholder engagement is also very necessary. Uh, organizations like this can be part of the, like, like uh, let me give you an example with Form 1. A apart from owning their own schools, they also adapt, they adopt public schools to help with the with the with the management, with the books, the, the teaching materials, sometimes the infrastructure, whatever the whatever is needed by the schools, is being uh, is being support. Uh, one supports such uh, public schools, so there are states and local governments that adopt public schools to ensure that the kind of education being being given by those schools is qualitative. And then they also raise awareness of parents on the importance of education, especially the girl-child education. In conclusion, the prospects for improving Nigerians' education system are promising, provided that the country commits to strategic long-term approach to reform. 
by addressing the key challenges identified in this paper and implementing the recommended strategies, Nigeria can build an education system that is not only equitable and effective, but also capable of supporting the nation's broader goals of economic growth, social cohesion, and sustainable development. The success of these efforts will ultimately determine Nigerians' ability to provide its citizens with the opportunities and skills needed to thrive in a rapidly changing world. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you. You deserve a round of applause. Yeah. Clapping from Professor Adiza. Thank you very much. So, 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 so. so, Prof, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Thank you, sir. So, I am really, really, really fat. We, 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 we are quite enlightened. You see the way the spirit moves, the way God arranged things by themselves, even though technology is still part of what we do. You know, our original topic, when, what I discussed with um, the education committee was how government policy on education can enhance quality education in public schools for the poor to promote peaceful coexistence. Now, what you have done for us is a very solid foundation. Now, we, you have told us, in fact, that is the, the principle, the policy, the foundation. So whatever we are going to talk now about whether this policy is affecting the poor, whether it's affecting Christian, or whether it's affecting Muslim, is solidly going to be based on this. So, Thank you very much for your presentation. We are enlightened, and I hope after this, we'll continue with the rest webinar, because the next webinar will be on the need for interreligious dialogue to be taught in schools, to be included in our curriculum in the universities and secondary school. And the next topic will be on dressing in school, in fact, specifically the hijab, the school uniform. How does this promote, you know, good foundation? Then the next one, as that is what we are going to do throughout this September. So, Prof, we are grateful. So may God bless and protect you. Thank you, sir. Christ, our Lord. Thank you. Amen. So, so now, now, thank you. Yeah. Now I invite, thank you very much. So I now invite the second speaker, Zumba Nicodemus. Congratulations, my sister. To, to give us thank you, his presentation. Nicodemus, do you want me to share your screen or you want to share by yourself? Yeah, I'm sharing. Okay. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Good evening. We can hear you. We can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, uh, my prof, for this wonderful presentation. And it's a wonderful uh, presentation that is so much to learn from this uh, presentation this evening. And I'm also, once again, grateful to God for the opportunity given to me for the second time to make another presentation on this uh, webinar. And I want to thank uh, the Education Committee for also appointing me to stand in from the Christian perspective to give on this topic that was given to us to look at. Um, I want to begin by uh, appreciating the, the NARAC platform that has been giving us always an opportunity to 
have an enlightenment to talk to ourselves and to also engage in finding a way forward towards ensuring peaceful coexistence in Nigeria. I will be dwelling, like the Prof have said, uh, the topic given to us at the Education Committee is how government policy on education can enhance quality education in public schools for the poor to promote peaceful coexistence. My presentation will be speaking from the perspective of the Christian community. And therefore, I will be uh, going further to my introduction. Uh, like the prof have said, education is a fundamental right to every child, every person. It's a key factor in fostering social cohesion, promoting values like love, peace, and understanding. But however, in Nigeria, some Christian communities are faced with significant challenges in assessing quality education. For example, in some northern parts of Nigeria, where there are religious tension and conflicts, which leads to marginalization of students, with schools situated in predominant Christian communities receiving less funding and resources that Muslim majority areas are opportune to have it. This disparity can lead to inadequate educational infrastructure and lack of basic facility, teaching materials, and qualified teachers. Violence incidents such as the adoption of 276 school girls by the Boko Haram in 2014 also disproportionately affect Christian students and educators. This example that I've given highlights the urgent needs for equitable government policies to address educational disparity and empower citizens towards promoting peace and unity across Nigeria. The objective of my paper this evening is to explore how effective government policies can enhance the quality of education in public schools, particularly for the poor, thereby promoting peaceful coexistence. Let's look at the Nigerian Constitution in section 18, subsection 1 and subsection 3, which states that the state shall direct its policy towards ensuring that there are equal and adequate education opportunities at all levels, which Hajia um, Professor had earlier stated. And section 3 also states that government should provide free, compulsory, and universal primary education for children of school age. According to UNESCO, Education for All in 2020 to 2015, which says that quality education encompasses not only academic excellence, but also development of critical thinking, which I think uh, my prof has also earlier stated so clearly, social skills and emotional well-being. Now, let's come back in to look at the impacts of quality education on our society generally. Quality education contributes to economic growth, which reduces poverty and fosters social harmony. When people are educated, it enhances peaceful coexistence. And I think the prof have rightly stated that where you have people educated, uh, you find peace peaceful coexistence uh, easy there. Now, but there are some of the challenges that we have in some of the government policies. I wouldn't want to bother us to go back to some of the policies that the Prof have earlier stated in her presentation, but I want to focus on some of the government policies and practices that are perceived as anti-peaceful coexistence in public schools today. Take, for instance, discriminatory curriculum. Curriculums that do not include diverse curricular, cultural, and religious perspectives can marginalize certain groups, fostering resentment and divisions among students. Inadequate funding, where there are disparities in funding between schools in different regions or communities, can exacerbate tensions, particularly when schools serving 
minority or less affluent population receive significantly less support. Three, lack of conflict resolution education. Where there is absence of programs that teach conflict resolution and peace building skills in our schools, this can lead to increased violence and misunderstanding. Uh, abduction of so many school students. Government have brought in safe school policy, whereby they are putting security armed men to guard and secure uh, schools. But overly militarizing these security measures in schools can cause a high atmosphere of fear in the minds of the student rather than safety, hindering open dialogue among students and promoting divisions. So also, we have also the case of neglect of religious freedom. There are policies of government that fail to um, respect the religious practices of all students. And support for marginalized groups. The lack of targeted support for, excuse me, for marginalized group, for students from marginalized communities can perpetuate cycles of poverty and exclusion, contributing to social unrest. Furthermore, we also have the case of failures to address bullying in our schools, especially in the public schools. Inadequate policies to combat bullying, especially based on religious or ethnic identity, can create hostility, hostile environment that undermine peaceful coexistence. Now, what are the current challenges facing Christian communities in public education today? Number one is funding inequality. Now, the prof has mentioned the case repeatedly, the issue of lack of funding, which is true. It's a general phenomenon, general challenge. But even in the little that is being, uh, that is being provided by the government, what we see in some areas is funding inequalities. Many Christian communities today affected areas are faced with significant funding disparities in public education. Schools in predominantly Christian regions often receive less financial support, limiting their ability to provide essential resources, infrastructure, and quality teaching. This inequality hampers the educational opportunity for children in these public schools. Also, this is disparity in terms of, uh, there are disparities in terms of appointment of chief executives in some states, or the awards of contracts of UBE or SUBEP in some states, especially in some Northern parts of this country. This sentiment can lead to uh, lack of peace, uh, of peaceful coexistence in our schools. We also have the case as a challenge of infrastructure deficiencies. Numerous public schools serving Christian, in serving Christian populations lack basic facilities such as clean water, proper sanitation, safe classroom. This not only affects the learning environment, but also poses health risks to students. In some areas, schools may be destroyed or damaged due to violence, and they are not replaced by the government further exhibiting the challenges faced by students. Now, I want to go on to talk about the government role. 
Sorry. Just a minute. Sorry, just a minute. Um, the version I'm using is not what I'm supposed to be using. So I want to talk about what the government policies ought to be doing. Marginalize, marginalization of, sorry, one minute. Cultural and religious biases. Marginalization of Christian in education curricula can lead to lack of representation and understanding of their values and beliefs. This can create an environment where Christian students feel isolated and discriminated against hindering their abilities to strive academically and socially. Now, how can government policies enhance this quality education from our Christian perspective? Number one, there should be curriculum development that is based for all. The government should develop an inclusive curriculum that incorporates Christian Muslim values and teachings. The exclusion of the Christian religions today in our schools has not rather brought help, but rather made students to become ungodly. This curriculum that can foster a deeper understanding of faith and morality, integrating peace education. I am happy that to hear that by next week we'll be talking about how in conflict uh, studies will be incorporated into our school's curriculum. Integrating peace education, Conflict resolution into the curriculum will empower our youth to navigate challenges and promote harmony in their communities, aligning with our calling to be peacemakers. The government should increase funding and resource allocation. It is crucial for the government to prioritize funding for schools in marginalized communities. By allocating adequate resources, we can ensure that every child has access to quality education regardless of his or her religious or ethnic background, reflecting our belief in the inherent dignity and worth of each individual created in God's image. Three, teachers training and support. It is imperative that government should invest in the professional development of teachers in public schools as essential by providing them with the necessary training Training and support, we can equip educators to nurture not only the academic growth of students, but also their spiritual and emotional well-being, embodying the holistic approach to educational champions by our faith. Four, community engagement. It is imperative also that the government should engage partnership between schools religious centers, which church and mosques, and community organization to strengthen education outcome by fostering active participation from parents and community members. We can create a supportive environment that reflects our community commitment to love and serve one another, building a stronger foundation for our children's education. Five, monitoring and evaluation. The government should implement a robust mechanism to access educational outcomes by ensuring accountability and effectiveness. By using data-driven approaches, they can identify areas needing improvement and advocate for necessary changes, fulfilling our respons responsibility to advocate for justice and equity in education for all children. Now, I want to draw before the conclusion, the role of 
IREC in promoting peaceful coexistence in education within the public school. First of all, the Nigerian Interreligious Council can play a vital role in fostering peaceful coexistence in education within public schools. Our recommendation from the Christian perspective to NIREC is as follows. NIREC should initiate a forum in public schools whereby nurturing an inclusive and harmonious educational environment that reflects our shared values of love, respect, and understanding should be there. Two, NIREC should, should, should initiate dialogue and collaboration in public schools by facilitating interfaith dialogue among religious leaders, educators, and community stakeholders where these public schools are situated, by promoting discussion that focus on mutual respect and understanding, NARE can help to bridge the divides between different faith communities, fostering a spirit of cooperation that is essential for peaceful coexistence in our schools. Curriculum advocacy. NARE can advocate for the inclusion of peace education and ethical teachings in our school curriculum by emphasizing the importance of empathy, tolerance, and conflict resolution. NIREC should support the development of well-rounded students who can engage positively with diverse perspectives embodying the Christian call to love one another, to love one's neighbor. Conflict resolution training. NIREC should provide training programs for educators and students on conflict resolution and mediating skills. These programs should equip participants with the tools to address and resolve disputes peacefully, promoting a culture of dialogue rather than violence within the school environment. Community engagement narrative should encourage active participation from religious organizations in educational activity initiatives by collaborating with local churches and faith-based groups local churches and mosques and faith-based groups, NIREC should help to create supportive networks that enhances the educational experience for all students, fostering a shared commitment to peace and unity. NIREC should be able to monitor educational policies and practices to ensure they promote inclusivity and equality by advocating for equitable treatment of all students regardless of their religious background. NIREC helps to create a safe and supportive learning environment that opposes the dignity of every child. Through these efforts, NARA can play a crucial role in promoting peaceful coexistence in our public school today, ensuring that education serves as a fundamental foundation for unity and understanding among Nigerian diverse communities. Together, we can work towards an educational system that reflects our shared commitment to peace and collaboration nurturing future generation in faith and fellowship. In conclusion, from the Christian perspective on this topic, Christians are urging the NIREC to advocate for the poor and to improve public schools education, ensuring every child receives the education they deserve. Investing in education can create a more equitable society, honoring individual dignity and promoting peaceful coexistence among diverse communities. Together, we can build a brighter future for the next generation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, Chairman of the committee, thank you, Professor Mafuz. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. So, can you just appreciate your your speaker? Then we we'll go into the public conversation because we are still going to. All leave. right. Yeah, appreciate your people. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Let yeah. me use this. This Let me use this video to appreciate our two lecturers tonight for not only doing the job, but for doing it very well. We are highly indebted to Prof. Adiza and my brother, then Reverend Nicodemus, for the presentation that they have been able to make tonight. We believe strongly 
that their recommendations, their discussions will also go a long way in advancing the course of education in Nigeria. So since this is just for me to appreciate you, to thank you, we appreciate the effort that you put into the presentation of your, into the preparation of your papers and the erudition you also put into their delivery. We really appreciate you. Thank, so you. thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. So now the floor is open. If you have a question, a contribution, could you please use the raise up hand sign? You will see it just right there, something like this. So I could see Salamatu up, a hand up. So Salamatu, you have the floor. I just allow me to unmute yourself and uh, talk. Well, thanks so much, uh, Prof, for the opportunity. So after that, you talk. have uh, so, sorry. After that, you have Sumaya Amza, so that we don't need to be calling one after the other. So, Salamatu, you are on the floor now. After you finish, Sumaya Hamza, please, just like that. Okay. Um. Oh, okay. First of all, first of all. Mm. Uh, first of all, I will start by appreciating our first speaker, uh, Professor Hadiza. Uh, Tukur, my sister, she is a beautiful presentation. In fact, she has given us uh, uh, a broad presentation of what educational policy in Nigeria is, its cons and its pros. Thank you very much. And then the Reverend presented uh, the challenges that the the Christian community face on education. Uh, that is excellent too. But then uh, to me, the, 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 challenges is, the challenges are general, not only the Christian community. If you can see that uh, for Islam, it has a beautiful structure. Even when the, when the Europeans came to Nigeria, they found out in the Northern part of Nigeria had, had their education. They had their Quranic education, they had their Ajemi, they can read, they can write, they have administrative system of government before the coming of the white men. But unfortunately, all these were discarded. The, 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 the Sangaya schools have no support from the government. Uh, all we, uh, the, 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 the Almadri schools are there left on touch. Uh, you can you can be uh, you can be an hafiz of the Quran. You can memorize the whole Quran by heart and the hadiths by heart. You have a knowledge from there and then. But then, as far as you cannot read and write your uh, a, a English, you are not you are not considered an educated person. No matter the level of education you 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 have, either the Arabic, the all the books you can memorize, you can. But you are not considered. Uh, a learned person as far as you cannot read and write in English. And this too, it's, it's a kind of uh, a constraint to the system of education we have because a section of, an, uh, of our education, the potentials that we have there are being left without being harnessed. That is the potentials we have that are being educated Islamically are, are left there if they cannot enter the mainstream of Western education, they are left there, uh, they are, they, 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 the potentials are not really being harnessed. So this also is a challenge on our own Islamic part, because uh, uh, I, I, I hope, uh, but I, uh, my sister, uh, the, the sister has given a lot of suggestion. He has also given a lot of suggestion. I hope it will go a long way in, uh, in also solving this problem that I'm talking about. And apart from that, she has even said it that uh, education nowadays, uh, you just learn, you memorize, but uh, no cre creativity. And, and this is very important because ed education is meant to solve problems. But we have the educationists and we have the learned people, but we are full of problems in our country. Sometimes we don't even know how to face the problem. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Father, can I go on? Hello? I have finished. I have said my own. Yeah, go ahead. Mm. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. 
I want to appreciate our two presenters, Prof and the Reverend. They have done justice to the uh, topic given to them. And they have given us a wake up call. Most importantly, our educational system is content based, as they have said. So this tells us that we need to make our education more functional. And our national policy advocates for a functional education, lifelong learning. It is the implementation of the policy provision that is the problem. So I just want to add in the area of teacher training, there's need for teachers to be trained on how to teach content in relation to reality. So not just to teach the content of curriculum, but they should link it up to reality so that it can be applied. So when applied application questions are asked to students, they will be able to answer it. And finally, I want to advocate for the fact that we need to make our children think deep and we must give them opportunity. Quite often in classes, students that ask questions are shut down by teachers. So we need to encourage teachers to allow and I give opportunity to students to be able to speak up, say their own mind and ask. They should explore. They should be able to ask questions and they should be allowed to also make their own suggestions. Thank you very much once again. And I want to thank Prof and Narek for the opportunity on this webinar that is ongoing. It is really, really not only teaching us the content of what we are doing, but also a form of uh, unity for Muslims and Christians to come together and rob minds in the interest of developing our nation. Thank you. Ananubo, please. After Ananubo, you have Miriam Abba, you have Victoria Hesolo, you have Professor Latifa. So just continue like that. Okay, good evening, everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, my my deepest appreciation to our two good presenters, evening. Professor Hadiza Ahmed Tuko and the Reverend Uzumba Nicodemus. I want to thank you for your detailed uh, presentation. I'd rather go straight to the issue at hand, uh, and that is that of mutual agreement that we don't have quality education. The policies are good, but what we have on ground is not is nothing to write home about. We are not getting value for what we think we should get. And why is that? Let me start first and foremost with teacher uh, lack of um, qualified teachers. The, the rot in the educational sector trickles down. So we have what we call inbreeding. We are recycling limited knowledge. We are recycling limited knowledge and that does not go us well. It doesn't go well with us. If I may suggest, one of the things we can do for teacher training is because we don't have, this, the, the truth of the matter is we don't have six or seven years to train new sets of teachers that would begin to pick up. We don't have that seven years. Uh, by the time we, with what is going on in Nigeria now in seven years time, a lot of rot would have come in. What if we look to our brothers, our sisters outside Nigeria, who are educated, who are professors, who are teachers in different fields, what if we are able to bring them during the summer holidays to come and help brush up these teachers we have here so that gradually they begin to pick up. Now, um, one thing I know about education, uh, at one of the uh, points is that education the benefit of education is it takes away poverty. And I look at the numbers of educated people, the numbers of graduates we have in Nigeria, and the struggle of the country, both as a nation uh, and as a family unit. We find out, we find out that our graduates are suffering. Why is that? Because our education is not suited to who we are. The first lecture we have in this series is that of anthropology. Uh, we are deliberately placed in our villages, in our tribes, in our cultures by God. These cultures are not reflecting in our education. Our religious belief is not reflecting in our education. Two parts of education 
One is the cognitive, the other is the transmitting. The cognitive is the ability to be able to learn, to be able to make sense of what you are being taught. And the transmitting is the ability to now be creative with what you have been taught. Our children are not dollars. Our children have been uh, uh, put in a system that makes them believe that the only way to pass is to load up and then drop, which is totally wrong. Now, I will, I will talk about the big elephant in the room, the issue of the 18 years exam or not. Yes, the minister is not the one that made that law. It is a law. But one of the things we must learn is that even as we want to make educational policies based on scientific data, based on scientific tests, let us not forget that this data as well can be compromised. This data as well reflects what responses that people or things you observe, they are subjective, they are not total. One thing is certain in man, and that is what God has instituted. If we go to our biology, the basic knowledge of biology, we are taught that man, one of the attributes of living being is adaptability, ability to adapt. So the situation in Nigeria is what people are reacting to. So when we react and we don't have policies that are helping in that reaction, we are going to definitely have lots of problems. When these children or when these individuals travel abroad, when they go to a society where they're able to express themselves better or they're able to understand what uh, the education is all about, they begin to excel. If we take a, a statistics of PhDs all across the world, I can bet that Nigeria will be in the top five, if not in the top three, <laughs> and not even leading by the way. So why is that? And most of these PhDs are people that have their basic education in this our uh, not so standard uh, basic education. So what I'm suggesting is this. First and foremost, the, the, our educational system, we must begin to in the UBEC, I know that one of the one of the uh, reasons, one of the objectives of UBEC is to make sure that every child is educated. But even if we look at the primary school education, is it preparing the children for the world we have today? The world we have today has gone global. It is no longer those days when we are limited to ourselves alone. With a phone, with a phone, we can connect anywhere, any culture in the world. Are our children ready to do business? Are they ready to do that? And secondly, if we're building, uh, if we're educating our children to just be educated and then go and become useful in another society, then we have killed the country. So we must begin to have deliberate educational policies that would build capacity and uh, we look at a situation where technical education is made almost compulsory. Let me give you just a hint of what I have in mind. First and foremost, let's assume a child finishes at 16 and is not permitted to write jam or go into the university until 18. We've been struggling with what to do with the two degrees, the two major degrees that we have in Nigeria vis-a-vis -vis the BSc and the HND, the Polytechnic Education. And if we must tell ourselves the basic truth, these two uh, line of education have different purposes, different, clear, different purposes. Now, what if we have a situation where these children write their work at 16? Because if we say we want to delay them now, let us not tell ourselves the lie. What these children are able to comprehend at their age, they are able to comprehend. So it's not as if all of them are being forced. I know that some schools cut corners, but a lot of them, when you engage them, you'll find out that they actually understand what these subjects are all about. So what if they write these exams at 16 and have their O-levels, and then they are not permitted to go to the university, but rather go to the polytechnic to get an OND. In that polytechnic, they are taught basic skills. They are taught technological skills. They are taught things, hands-on, that can, practical things, that can help build them. And why they do that, they are going to be matured and they are going to have skills and their mind will be further opened. By the end of that two years, they are 18, they can be awarded OND if they have passed. And then 
get ready to write jam and then go to the university. In the, in the United States of America, you, you don't do medicine directly. They, they fashioned it to what they needed in their society. And that is why their, their medical sciences is one of the best in the world. So we must do the same in Nigeria. Our children are three at four. The key, the key to any heart is language. If, if you travel abroad and somebody speaks your native language, you warm up to them immediately. I'm not saying that we should start bugging our children with mathematics and physics at the age of three or four. But what I'm saying is, what if at that age of three, four, when they are supposed to be creative, when they are in the nursery schools, what if we start teaching them colors, we start teaching them music, we start teaching them uh, uh, all these basic things, communication, different languages. They can pick up four, five, six languages, both local and international at that age, so that uh, when they grow, when they go to the primary schools, they can read any journal, they can read books, they can decide to take their chemistry in Arabic language or in Chinese, and they are able to be more effective, they can understand better. If we, we had a, a, an informal recite that we just did some time ago, children abroad, six years, seven years, you show them, they come in contact with a man, and you say, describe who you just saw. And they will give you perfect details whereby an artist can reproduce the image of that person they saw. But when you bring the same challenge to a Nigerian child, he will only tell you he's one man like that, he's one, he one baba like that, he's tall, he's, and that is all. So we need to be able to build this first foundation in our children to open their minds to the creativity, the beauty, the joy of education. And then we can start building from there. What I'm saying is, we can adapt our policies to the challenges we are actually facing in Nigeria. We can make our educational policy. We don't have to follow, uh, okay, Canada does 18, so we must do 18. No, Canada is not Nigeria. Their challenges are not what we are facing here. Here, father and mother work, and they, they may not have the time. They may not have the time for those children. That is why we drop our children early at the crutch, at the nursery. So we must build these things into our consciousness, into our policies. And then again, like uh, 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 Reverend Uzumba said, and the prof equally pointed out then, we found out that corruption is an issue. Why? We go to church a lot, we go to mosque a lot, but our children are not understanding, even we, we are not understanding what value we are supposed to get from this religious education. So if we start early, uh, there, there is an African adage that says, when a tree grows into a matured tree, we can no longer bend it. Most of us have good minds because of the foundation that we have been given, you know, that foundation of non-negotiable goodness that we've been given. And some of us that ran into trouble was because they didn't have that firm grip and they, they allow their minds to sway. So these are things we need to build first, the foundations we need to put in our children first before we now start giving them the formal education of numbers, the formal education of uh, piecing letters together or being expressing themselves. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. <clears throat> good evening, everyone. Uh, I believe Nigeria has such beautiful policies that never see the light of the day because um, the political will to implement it is just not there. It is lacking. I mean, like, um, NAREC needs to work on seeing these policies used. Maybe that is one place NAREC should um, work on. Education in this country is really, really underrated. It is real and vital for NAREC to work on seeing that it receives the deserved attention. Um, I wish the second speaker was more specific and he gave examples of those areas where children of a particular faith are marginalized so that action can be taken. I think it's, it's not enough just to mention it just like that without examples or figures or whatever. Um, okay, we are all at the receiving end. We pray for leaders that will truly make a change in the education sector and remove all stumbling blocks. Thank you.
Good evening. Good evening. I guess it's my turn now to talk. Hey, of course, sure. Go ahead. Good evening. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you very much, uh, the moderator, uh, Prof, for the opportunity. And let me also appreciate the two speakers, my sister, Professor Adisa, and the Reverend Father. Uh, Professor Adisa cited inadequate funding as one of the challenges. I quite agree with you. But the question is, how are the mega funds being managed? What about monitoring? What about commitment, dedication, sincerity on the part of the managers? Another factor is the, the inspectorate division, monitoring division. I think they should be overhauled. They should be enhanced, overhauled, and enhanced. And then when you come to the basic education, I think there are laws and rules that govern the operation of education policies. These laws should be strictly followed. For example, I think under the Basic Education Act, any parent preventing his or her child from receiving basic education should be made to face the law. So implementation of these policies matter, but not with lip service, not on paper. We should be actively involved. You have these policies, they are good policies, but the managers must be sincere. The managers must do their work very well. So it is very important that the, uh, we need to overall the monitoring inspectorate sessions, the money being, we as NIREC, we should be one of the, uh, one of the, one of the uh, monitors, which we made to monitor how those funds are being managed. So, and finally, I hope um, the local government autonomy, we hope it will assist to boost the quality of basic education. You know, it's not the basic education is at local government levels. So we hope when the local government autonomy is finally in operation, we hope it will assist. We hope it will not be just the same, like when we have it now. You no, know, the proper management, uh, improper management, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank Good you, evening. Prof. Yeah, uh, yes, hello, yeah. Um, let me start by commending the two speakers, Prof and our Reverend, for doing a good job on the topic. And I want to say that uh, most people that have contributed, especially the last person that contributed, is like she has seen what I wanted to say by, you know, picking those points. Because, um, Actually, we are talking of, um, we are looking at low salary payments because it's not only um, insufficient funding. Teachers are not paid as expected. If teachers are paid very well, before you become a doctor, you become, you know, uh, anything in this world, Somebody must have taught you. You have passed through the four walls of the classroom. And by so doing, you cannot come out and you will now be the one to be boss over your teacher. Because some teachers, when they even see their students, their puppies, it's like saying yes sir, to them again. The position they will see them. So there is need for teacher salary to be increased because if you are not paying them very well, some of them are not ready to teach again. And where they are putting them in, for example, a graduate that is not even a, teach, a, a qualified teacher, we see some of them in the school. You see, when they come, they will still be boss over the NCE. And it's not supposed to be like that. NCE should be rated high because of their level and the places because of the practical they have passed through. So I want to say that there is need for increase of teacher salary. And penalties, stiff penalties should be given to parents. You see, in the north, you see children begging up and down. The number of out-of-school children is still high, if we are to say the truth. And in the south, we see them hawking here and there. 
So the number is high in the south, it's high in the north. And what are the parents doing? The time they are supposed to be in school, the children are selling things. They are begging. It's not supposed to be. And tomorrow, we want them to be great. How can these children be great if they don't go to school? There is need for them to go to school. So government should give the parents stiff, you know, penalty so that they will stop doing sending their children to where they are not supposed to be at a particular time. And also, I want to say that the federal government has given local government financial autonomy, whereby they do their, after doing their elections, the grants will be given to them and the grants will be used. So lo local government is coming to the grassroots very well. What do they need to do? There is need for them to set up community vanguard. In as much as they, they do this and they are able to set up community vanguards to monitor those because you can monitor your, you know, within the community, they can monitor themselves. When they see that, okay, these children are supposed to be in school, it's not going to school. It's easier done in the community level than in the state level because they know each other and they know the children that are supposed to be in school that are not in school. So by so doing, they will be able to write out the names of the parents. It's not the children they will punish now. It should be the parents sending them. Then when that one is done, they will stop it. So thank you, the two speakers. And I want to thank Prof for doing, you know, justice to all these topics because you are the one bringing out topics for all of us to discuss. You have been doing a great work. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Augustine Alicia, please. Augustine Alicia. Okay. It's like uh, we have exhausted all the people who want to talk. Okay, I've raised my hand. Yeah. Okay, you know, so you're now official delegate now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Professor Mahfouz. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We we cannot actually appreciate you enough, uh, the executive secretary, for the commitment that has been put into making this webinar series go on on behalf of the education committee because this is actually part of educating Nigerians, promoting peace, advancing development. Um, after appreciating the two speakers, uh, when I realized that policy featured prominently in the topics, I was actually expecting them, and maybe this forum, to actually identify policies, and then I interrogate them with a view to making us to know the weaknesses and the strengths that these policies have. I think the discussion that we've had so far has centered around the challenges of education generally. And those challenges cannot not be exhausted. You know, these discussions have always been coming up every now and, and then. When we are talking about specific policies and policies of government, policies of government, which particular policies are we interested in interrogating? Are we talking of the provisions of the national policy of education that has been that, 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 that have been revised on and on and they are identifiable? Are we talking of the policies of the APC government? The Bari government came up with 10 policies, the 10 pillars of education in Nigeria. It said it will focus on out of school children, youth and adult literacy, science, technology, and engineering basic and secondary education, library services, teacher education and capacity building, tertiary education, curriculum and policy matters, education data and planning, information and communication technology. This was a clear cut policy of the federal government that was supposed to be implemented within eight years. 
But what has happened to this policy? This year, in, in April, the current government ruled out another policy that their own focus will be on dots, data repository out of school children. Okay, they have established the National Commission for Admiral Education out of school children, and it is functional now. So training teachers development, I was looking forward to us identifying these policies, interrogating them, and making certain recommendations so that we know, oh, this policy, this policy is faulty. This is how we can make it to be effective. This one is, so that was actually my expectation. So my hope is that our presenters may actually want to put this into consideration with a view to adding the specific policies they are interrogating in their papers so that um, they may make the presentations to be more focused on this area since we are focusing on policies, not education in general. That's my critical pressure. I want to thank you once again. And I appreciate thank, yeah, all the thank, participants yeah, for your Thank you very much. Thank you. So you know that you are going to take some of these points as your report to NIREC in our November meeting. And what your committee, I, 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 you know, your committee are supposed mm -hmm. to start working on implementation or not to, you know, let's like the next one now we are going to talk about interreligious dialogue in secondary and tertiary, tertiary institution. So you should just take note of the points yeah, yeah. that, that NIREC should yeah, focus yeah. on. We have made 14 recommendations to the committee. It's okay. Yeah. Nice. Uh, yes, we've made 14 recommendations to the mm. NIREC. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much. You are thank just you. wonderful. So Alimat is there, Jibri. Yes, Prof. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. uh, I want to lend my voice to congratulate uh, both presenters for a job well done. I uh, I think we should be concerned about the demand and supply factors in education. For as long as, yes, basic education is free and compulsory according to the uh, Nigerian law, but nobody is enforcing it. Nobody is, you know, uh, getting parents to compulsorily enroll their children. We may have policies on the ground that, you know, uh, look very attractive and viable, but for as long as we do not implement, we do not, you know, uh, make concerted efforts at implementation, we will continue to have this large number of out of school children uh, in our societies. Uh, two, both speakers have uh, highlighted the issue of the quality of education. UNESCO said uh, 20, only 20% 20 of children that complete primary school in Nigeria are able to read and write, only 20%. You see, uh, for the ordinary parent in the community, the end does not justify the means. If my, my child will spend six years in primary school, yet he cannot read and write, then what have I achieved? And they are also looking at the opportunity cost. Uh, should I allow my child my child to waste these six years without achieving anything, or should I withdraw him midstream from school and put him on the farm or send him to tend my cows, you know, or do hawking if, if she's a girl, to take uh, kuli kuli and uh, soya, soya wara to the market. So parents are looking at this. And we, we as educationists, we as uh, CSOs, uh, religious organizations must uh, advocate where it is necessary for a change to be made. Finally, what do we do about insecurity? The recent, yes, the recent kidnappings have 
created have uh, the, <laughs> created enormous problems because uh, parents will now be thinking of, look, let me marry off my girl uh, as soon as possible. She can no longer attend a school where bandits come and abduct girls to, to, to the bush. What do we want to do about education? I think we need to brainstorm and see what suggestion we can make, you know, for safe schools, like uh, Brother Innocent mentioned, uh, the military, or was it him or Reverend Nicodemus? You know, the presence of military men in the schools does not necessarily guarantee uh, security for children. Uh, recruitment of teachers, we need to pay uh, serious attention. So far, we only recruit those who have no option. We also recruit uh, based on politics. If uh, you have thoughts that have uh, helped somebody to come to power, then you say, please give him, even if it is a teaching job. A teaching job is so denigrated, you know? So how do we get quality education if that is our manner of teacher recruitment? Thank you for the opportunity, Father, and uh, congratulations to both Reverend Nicodemus and Professor uh, Hadiza Chuku. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Please, Augustine, Elisha, are you still there? You'll be raising your hand that I'll be calling you. Yes, I am here, sir. Okay. Um, Are you hearing me? Oh, sure. Okay. Um. Uh, first of all, I want to appreciate uh, all both the Professor Tukur and the Reverend Ozumba for making for uh, making effort to present very well on the topics given to them. Um, even though some of the things I wanted to say have been actually been said by the previous speakers, previous uh, contributors. But then I want to say that we have very beautiful policies in Nigeria, but the implementation is our problem. We have a lot of uh, things that have been designed our educational policy in Nigeria, but then how do we implement them? That's the problem. And so as both the religions, Christianity and uh, Islam, we are all stakeholders. We can contribute immensely. We can make the policy work as presented in these papers. We are the ones that can push to make sure that these policies work. And that is what I want to also yes. contribute because uh, those things that I wanted to say have already been said. I don't want to make repetitions. So, Thank you so much for yeah. the opportunity. Thank you, sir. So, yeah, we have overshot our time. Uh, I, I can see Ananubo's hand up after you. If there's no other person, our presenters will have um, three, three minutes each to wrap up, to respond to all the conversation and questions. If you still have your eyes wide open and you are not sleeping, and we can give them five, five minutes to wrap up. So, Ananugo, please. Okay, thank you, Prof. Um, I, ju I just want to underline what uh, Professor Prof, uh, the I, I, I think I can't, I can't I can't remember his name now, but I'm sorry for that. But he said that he expected us to discuss about the policies, and which is true. So I'm suggesting, sir, uh, with all uh, humility, is it possible we take this session again? It may not be immediately where we are able to, to really dissect and then come up because I heard you just say there's a meeting coming up in November. 
so that we can look into it holistically. Because education is the foundation of uh, everything. We can, uh, there was a time we used to have these webinars, Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we can make, if possible, I'm just suggesting, if possible, we can pick one of the Thursdays again and have uh, another look at this topic so that we can come up with something more uh, very robust and something uh, worth the while. Thank you so much, Prof. Mm -hmm. God bless you. Yeah, the, yeah, just to quickly respond to you, Ms. Anonubo, the whole of September is devoted to education. Because our yeah, the education committee, they have a lot to do this week. So the on Tuesday, they are going to talk about this. We are still going to talk about the same thing. On Tuesday, we are getting a professor from a uh, University of Ibadan, that is uh, Professor Afiz, and a professor from Ahmad Bello University, Zaria. That is a professor, a Reverend Professor Tanko. So they are going to talk about this same policy, but with emphasis on how these policies can bring harmony into the university institution, teaching of interreligious dialogue in the institution. And we have gone very far. Um, professor Afiz has presented a paper at the last NIREC, which I have also signed. They have, have given him a letter for implementation and Professor Mahfouz, the education committee, they're already working on it to make sure that interreligious dialogue is taught in tertiary and secondary institution. So all these policies will still come in. Then the third one, we are going to talk about harmony, but we are going to talk about the, the, the uniform, school uniform proper. We are going to talk about hijab, does hijab uh, distract anybody from learning? We, you know, the mode of dressing, teaching morals in our beginning from our secondary and primary schools. Then the other is the whole of September is devoted to education. So all these policies will still come in, and maybe we are going to still rephrase our, you know, and again, um, we have. Um, we have also our next meeting in NIREC. The NIREC meeting is going to be in Aqua Imbo by the grace of God. And the theme for that NIREC meeting is our, nat our, our natural resources and insecurity in Nigeria. And this education will still come in, especially kidnapping and adopting school children is going to come up. So these are some of the things. So I think uh, we are, we are cause that we just decided to devote the whole of September to education. So thank you very much. I'm sure we have exhausted all our questions. So we, may we uh, Reverend Uzumba, could you please have your five minutes to wrap up? Mm. Well, yeah. five minutes, I think it's too much. Yeah. Okay, okay, one minute. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Reverend has actually memorized here. <laughs> okay, Reverend, can we go to <laughs> Professor Tuku then? Yes. At least just appreciate those who have commented commended you. Yeah. Yes, that's what yeah. I, want to just to, I want to say thank you. I think uh, the essence of this uh, webinar is for us to uh, spur in us the, the spirit of that unity. Unless we have this confrontational and open uh, discussion like this and know where we are hearing, not in any way to uh, look down on someone or to, to attack on anything. I wouldn't want to go, uh, one of the speakers was saying, uh, if I was go to specific, I would mention state and even uh, areas, which I wouldn't want to make that. Uh, but I want to say thank you to all the comments that have been made and to my chairman, um, the policies that you've mentioned, which I've also noted, I I will look at it carefully and then we'll look at it further in, the, in our further conversation. Thank you very much for your time. God bless you all. Yeah, you thank know, you. yeah, thank in the course of the conversation, uh, uh, Salimatu, I don't know if that's it. Salimatu asked you, you know, to measure specific um, areas where, you know, like Christian community that are 
be marginalized in terms of policies. But actually, that will come up. Yeah. Uh, so you let know, me give I, one example. No, no, no. It's, you are not going to give it to us now. Those yeah. examples will come up on Tuesday because <laughs> on Tuesday, no, 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 no. It's not on Tuesday. The other Tuesday. So note those examples so that when we are now talking about marginalization and all that, because I'm not the Muslim woman or the Muslim men, it will come out because I already have the name of some schools that the Muslim women are not are deprived of certain things because they wear hijab to school. That will come up very soon. And also, mm -hmm. you know, these are things because we want harmony, we want peace in this country. We cannot be shy away from all these things, you know, because uh, we need to handle them head on. So may I now invite our professor Adiza to please wrap up. After that, then uh, uh, Professor Mahfouz will give the closing remarks. Good evening once more. And uh, mm. I want to appreciate everyone. Thank you very much uh, for the wonderful uh, work Nairek is doing. Uh, I have heard what people have said. I've heard various comments. Uh, uh, almost all of them are in line, but uh, I want us to appreciate the fact that uh, we have to have a scope. You cannot cover everything on the policy unless you take specific uh, policy to say you are talking on this. Similarly, you cannot exhaust the challenges. And uh, remember that uh, some of the good things in the policies are also appreciated as opportunities we have and how we can utilize them. There are so many aspects of education that uh, this, this time does not give us, the time given, the allocated time does not give us room to cover. So I hope in the future we'll take uh, specific topics and ask people to make their presentations on that. Otherwise one is limited. Thank you very much. Mm. Professor and, uh, Adiza, do you, you promise, do you promise that you will continue with this, that you will not stay back after your presentation because we want you available in this, this especially this September on education? Wow, I'm, I'm afraid that I am committed, sir. <laughs> it's only <laughs> I one am day. committed. It's only a Tuesday uh, in a week. One Tuesday I am in a committed, week. sir. Okay, but I, I was... already have for the, this month of September, I have other presentations that I'm making on the area of education. And then I am overwhelmed. <laughs> no, you are not making so presentation. I... You will just listen and advise us. Well, just... As our okay. education advisor. You are okay. not making I'll presentation. I'll do my best, sir. Uh, I'll do my best, sir. Uh, uh, Professor Mahfouz, please pursue Inshallah. Professor Adiza for us. <laughs> 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 okay, okay, thank you. So thank you, I... sir. So, Professor Mahfouz, now can you now give a closing remark? Mm. So, it's been a night well spent. Yeah. We cannot thank you enough, uh, ES, for making this opportunity available. I think education will deserve all the attention that we can give it because it is the foundation, as we already pointed out, of everything. Without education, we can only build a nation on a fertile foundation, and anything can make that country or that nation to collapse easily. My remarks will just be to draw attention to the fact that education is not limited to literacy. As a matter of fact, it has three domains, the cognitive, the affective, and the psychomotor, you know, the head, the heart, and the hands. So it is only when these three are harmonized that one will be said to be truly educated. When we look at the challenges we have about this issue, the challenges that we have, hello? Oh. Yeah, we are here. The challenges that we have about education, thank you very much. That the challenges of education we have in Nigeria border on the fact that we only focus on the cognitive, as it has been pointed out. Education has to reflect in the heart, our attitudes, our character. That is one major area where Nigeria is lacking. You have our leaders, they may be in the National Assembly, they may be in government houses everywhere. They may have all the information in their heads, the principles of accounting, the principles of econometrics. They know everything. But 
turning all this knowledge into their attitude, their behavior, their conduct in office. It's a different thing entirely. So education also has to reflect in the character. And then the last component has to do with what we can be able to do with our hands. Nigerians generally are still lacking in this particular domain. Anyone that is truly educated should be able to do certain things with his hands. And that one is basic and fundamental. That is why the emphasis now is not just on degrees, but also on skills. But if we are to education right, right from the beginning, nobody will even be telling us about and having skills because it's actually part of it. The head has to be developed, the heart has to be developed, and the hands also have to be developed for one to be wholly educated. It is only when one of these components is missing that we are going to be facing some of the challenges we are facing in the country. Uh, banditry, criminality, everything has to do with the character. Lack of character development, a major component of education joblessness, idleness, it is because of the inability to do things based on what we are supposed to know. So I believe that if we emphasize this tripartite, uh, this tripartite domain of education, and um, we inculcate our students, our children on that basis, we'll be able to make a headway as a nation. And by not also reducing education to what only goes on in the school system, that is also a problem that many people are doing. Let's revise the curriculum. Let's revise the curriculum. Let's revise the curriculum. In America today, they are complaining about their education. The best educational system they know that is just one country and in Finland. So it is unknown. So the Chinese people are complaining about their education. Nothing is perfect. The biggest room in the world is the room for improvement. But if everybody plays their responsibilities, the parents too, we as parents will not have to abdicate from our responsibility and just think, think that the teachers alone can do it all. No, education actually begins from the home and it is the responsibility of each parent also play his or own part in the orientation of our children. That is the only way through we are going to have one of the cardinal goals of education in Nigeria, which is the development of a just, the egalitarian society. Without that, parents playing their role, teachers playing their role, religious playing their don't their point playing their roles, and then we are able to have a kind of a total personality, a complete human being. That is the only way we will be able to achieve the Nigeria of our dream. This will go as part of we'll go for my closer remarks today. I want to thank the ES once again. I want to appreciate our presenters today. Professor Adiza and the Reverend Podemos. I also want to appreciate all the participants who have enriched this discourse mm -hmm. with their various views, with their various opinions that they have expressed on this platform. We hope that subsequently you are still going to join us to advance development, to advance education in this country through this wonderful platform that NIREC has provided. I thank you once again and I wish everyone a pleasant night rest. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And also greetings from the co-chairman. Thank you, sir. Greetings from the co-chairman, the Sultan and the Khan president. So yes. we are appreciative of your participation. And you can be sure yes. that with them behind you, you will be able to achieve, you know, we'll be able to make our point known to government. So if uh, Reverend Lydia, welcome from Ghana, you will say the closing prayer, and uh, Miriam Abba Muhammad, if you are there, you close for us. So Lydia, please. Okay. Please let us pray. Father, we thank you. We glorify you and we worship your holy name. We thank you for goodness and mercies that you have shown to us this day. And Father, most of all, we thank you for those you have given this wisdom and knowledge to impart in us. Father, continue to give them more and abundantly so that next time they will be able to teach us and to teach others. Father, we thank you for this Nairic and each and everyone here. 
Father, let everything that we have been learning and what we have learned today be a useful to others so that always we'll be able to impact what we have been learning to others. Father, we thank you for everything in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Miriam Abba Muhammad, are you there? Yes, Father. Oh, yeah, pray for us. Thank you. Amen. So with this, I ask Almighty God to bless you. Amen. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So remember, Amen. on Tuesday, please, it's going to be another good one. Our professors from Amadubele uh, uh, University and University of Ibadan will be addressing us. So thank you very much and have a pleasant and peaceful night rest. Good night. Good night, bro. Yeah. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Sheikh good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Regina, good night. Good night, evening. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Good, -bye. good night, everyone. Have a good night, Grace. Mm.